This is Blackstone Joe, and you're listening to Slick Talk. If I say I'm an oil man, you will agree. Hello and welcome to episode 129 of Slick Talk. I am your host, Blackstone Joe, and I'm glad you're here. Today is November 4th, which means that Feast Week is rapidly approaching. As such, it's only fitting that I provide a smorgasbord of information in this latest episode built upon three different topics. And like a lineup of Thanksgiving sides, They're savory in their own way, but a lot of overlap among them too. So it doesn't really matter what your knowledge base or familiarity with this show or oil in general is going in, you'll leave with more information about the wide world of oil than you had before. To kick things off, we had longtime customer Andy write in and mention that he's buying a 1988 M3, which had been sitting for seven years. Mileage on the oil is unknown, but it seems to be running fine. Andy wants to know, when is the best time to get an oil analysis done to see what condition it's in? Is the existing oil helpful? If he flushes it with fresh oil, should he sample right away or drive some first? Well, when you want to check to see, uh, there's really not a bad time to start. But what constitutes good or bad in this case can really depend on What exactly you want to know? Glaring issues can stand out in very little mileage. And of course, some results can have that ambiguous nature where you may not know for sure what's happening without knowing the mileage it took to accumulate metal, for example. But some issues, such as contaminants being present, well, that's bad news regardless of the mileage. And of course, some metals look bad no matter what. Think about it like a blood pressure test. Some readings being slightly out of spec may spur an interesting question, like the one my doctor asked me the last time I had my blood pressure tested. They asked, did you drink a monster energy drink or something like that before coming over? Now look, had it been eighth grade me? Yes, I would probably had two if I could have, but not now. I didn't even have any coffee before the appointment. But at the same time, my blood pressure wasn't so high that the doc was ready to assume an issue, much less start looking for one. It was just a number to follow up on, and engines are often a lot like us humans in that they can produce some results that we want to talk about and look into at a later date, but not all above-average metals, for example, indicate a surefire problem. But then again, some can speak to a glaring problem, and that's why sending in an unknown mileage sample wouldn't hurt. The thing is, if you're anticipating a breakdown of how exactly metals match up with averages, you'll want to send in a sample with a known amount of mileage first. There can also be results such as a viscosity being, say, a little thicker or thinner than expected, Maybe that could speak to past use of an additive, but we'll take readings like that with a grain of salt because if they're not due to, let's say, harmful contamination such as coolant or fuel, things that we can check for and identify regardless of mileage on the oil, then similar to metals, a viscosity being slightly high or low isn't necessarily a sign of trouble either. We'll look at insolubles too, and if they're high, then maybe that oil was run fairly long, But again, that would put itself in the category of a result that we mainly want to note and check back on rather than assume a problem. So basically, think about a baseline as a good place to start, even if there are some unknowns. We'll look for anything that's a glaring issue no matter what mileage was on that oil. But for things to be as dialed in as possible, understanding how much metal that engine is making per mile compared to what we typically see, that would require a known amount of mileage to complete the picture. As for dumping that oil, putting a fresh fill in, and then sampling, 
that would offer you the least amount of information relative to the condition that engine is in because if you're essentially sampling fresh oil that has nothing on it we might find some metal just whatever carried over from the previous fill but if it's essentially fresh oil then there is what you could consider the most limited view of what's going on in the sump and as such, you might be in, in some situations where, you know, you're sampling an oil that hasn't been run long. You didn't know what was on it at all. It looks very clean. Take that with a grain of salt as well. Oil won't have accumulated metal just from sitting, and it won't have broken down either. So... This owner, Andy, could even find themselves in a situation where they sample oil that's been sitting for seven years. They don't own the mileage on it. They may even be able to run that oil longer. The reason I roll into this next topic is because a lot of people around this time of year are ready to put their vehicle into storage. And they are wondering if that oil is fine to keep in use or if they need to put fresh oil in because... They're concerned about calendar time and the impact it can have on the oil in the sump. And I'm glad to report that time alone isn't something you need to factor into your maintenance plan when you're talking about a gas or diesel engine that is not up in the air and that aircraft kind of have their own rules governed by issues such as corrosion that can creep in from sitting. That doesn't apply to a car or truck or any sort of passenger vehicle that's going to be out on the road, off-road diesels, whatever the case may be. If it's a gas or diesel engine in the automotive world, you can put calendar time aside and just look at the mileage instead. And if you want specific data points to back that up, well, data we've got. The first one being a sample from a 2019 911 Turbo, specifically the 3.0 flat six. The owner sent in this first sample from the vehicle, and they also want to note that the oil had been in use for 15 months. This being a bit longer than the factory recommended interval of 12 months or 10,000 miles. Importantly, this oil only had 4,943 miles on it. Now, that interval is a little bit longer than our 3,600 mile average for the engine type. But remember, that's just an average based on the mileage that we're being sent. It is by no means our rule or our guideline for what you should be running. And this is a good example of why our averages are just a reference, because this oil was holding up very well. The TBN read 7.2. When a TBN gets to about 2.0 or less, that's the point when there's not really a significant amount of active additive left. One reason why you'd want to avoid running longer, but of course we're also going to look at metals and viscosity to see if a longer or a shorter run is necessary. In addition to a strong TBN, we also found metals in very good shape compared to averages. The only metals that turned up in the sample were aluminum, iron, and copper. Iron was still at an average level, despite this oil run being a bit longer than that 3,600 mile average that I referenced earlier. Aluminum was low, so with that we can see that the pistons are wearing very well. And copper shows a perfectly average amount of brass bronze wear. We didn't find any chrome from the rings, no lead, no tin, and zeros, never a bad thing. So here you have an instance where 15 months, clearly no problem. But we wanted to look at how things ended up on a per mile basis, because again, that's where the metal is being made. That's where the active additive is being put to the test. And here, had this oil only been sampled and not changed, an even longer run would have been doable. That's something to consider if you're in a situation where you don't necessarily want to do a full oil change, especially when you're sampling you know, an engine with a sump capacity where an oil change is really a financial burden at times, only sampling and finding out if you can run it longer can often save a lot of money down the road. And just in general, it's a good idea when you're building your maintenance plan to see if you can push that interval, even if it's not something you're necessarily crazy about going in, just knowing that, say, if you have a road trip coming up and you want to know if you can tack on another 1,000 miles to the oil change interval you typically run because it would make things a lot easier logistically, then it's good data to have on your side knowing that, hey, I typically go 5,000, let's say, but should I need that extra 2,000 miles? Could it be doable? And here would be a situation where if the owner mentioned an interest in extending that oil change interval, 
going even closer to the 10,000 miles that Porsche recommends, it could certainly be doable based on what we're looking at in that sample. Some of you may not be impressed by 15 months or 4,943 miles though, so let's up the ante at least in terms of calendar time and talk about a sample, this being Amsoil 10W40 being run in a Yamaha 600cc engine. This oil was in use for two years, and how did it look? Well, it looked very good. The TBN was 8.8, .8, well above the 2.0 or less that I mentioned earlier as the point where we consider active additive to basically be used up. And also, the viscosity looks good. I say that kind of as a pleasant surprise in that motorcycle engines often tend to shear that oil down a bit. It's not a concern, but when the viscosity is normal, it's almost kind of like, hey, look at that. Who would have thought? You know, so it's just kind of one of those things where you never want to take it for granted and assume that just because a lot of motorcycle engines tend to shear it down, that doesn't mean it's a fact of life for all of them. And this one still had normal viscosity, strong TBN. Metals looked very good too. Our averages for this engine type are based on a 1600 mile run. This oil was run 2200 miles. A little extra aluminum, like two parts per million off of the average. But this is also a low mileage engine that could even be lingering wear in. Even if it's a level the engine normally produces, it's still quite good. Remember, averages are a starting point for comparison. So if we find that your levels are close in a healthy balance, then having an extra PPM here or there doesn't signal a problem. For those out there not impressed by two years, let's double it and talk about a sample with four years on it. This coming from a 2005 M3 powered by an S54 engine. Four years in the sump, but with a TBN still quite strong at 8.3, a normal viscosity, no signs of harmful contamination, and best of all, a wear profile that anyone would love. This coming after 3,000 miles of use, metals all red low down the line. We didn't find a single part per million of lead. For this particular model, the bearings were still lead from the factory, and if the factory bearings are still in use, not having a single part per million of lead tells us the bearings didn't produce any measurable wear, and even if this particular owner switched to aluminum, that metal is still better than average. This would be an impressive report even for an oil run shorter than the 3,000 miles being sampled, Yet another example of why calendar time did not dictate metals accumulating, nor did it affect the physical properties in any meaningful way, you still saw multiple data points of that oil clearly holding up well. And finally, I had a question from a listener of the podcast, David, who is in the process of bringing a 2002 RAV4 back up to speed and as part of his maintenance plan, David was thinking about using Valvoline's Restore and Protect Oil and was looking for what I can assume just a rundown of the product, what it looks like. And on that note, if you aren't familiar with Valvoline's Restore and Protect and how it looks from our vantage point, I'm here to tell you that it is an add to package that looks pretty typical. And I don't mean that in a bad way, just that it doesn't have a wildly different add package than what you might see in other products, which is kind of a good thing as well in the sense that it doesn't use any particular add elements that would also like mimic contamination, let's say. You know, some oils like Chevron Dello ADF use an add package where we want to make sure we note that some additive elements such as potassium, let's say, can also indicate coolant, so it's something to keep in mind if you're using it. Doesn't mean it's a bad additive, it's just outside the norm for what we typically see. Here in this case though, it's an additive package comprised of the usual suspects like moly, boron, phosphorus, and zinc for anti-wear purposes, and then you also have calcium and magnesium, detergent dispersant additives that are used to hold particles in suspension so they can be filtered. It's the presence of additives like calcium and magnesium that are why it's okay if you sample at one point in the drain versus another. They hold things in suspension so that way metals are a pretty even spread. If you've ever seen our sampling instructions, we do tell you to sample midstream, not for the clearest look at metals though, or contaminants, most contaminants, let's say, 
you mainly want to avoid sampling right at the start of a drain because that's when dirt or debris from around the drain plug area can sneak in. But other than that, things like fuel, coolant, or of course dirt that can get in past the air filter if you have like a crack or leak along the intake plumbing, those things are going to show up regardless of the point at which you're sampling and metals are the same. So that's what detergent and dispersants help to do, as well as, of course, hold those particles in suspension so the oil filter can remove them during the oil run. But beyond the additive package, uh, the TBN of this particular sample that I pulled up, this being a 520 version of the Restore and Protect, it looked quite good after 5,125 miles of use, a TBN of 4.8, so plenty strong if that owner was interested in running longer. But of course, what influences a TBN in one motor is different from another. So I would caution anyone from assuming that, you know, just because there's one example of this oil holding a TBN over that amount of mileage means they can run even longer on their particular interval. It's really specific to that engine's narrative as far as what our recommendations will be. Keep in mind, a TBN is one piece of the pie. It's not the whole thing. So in this case, based on how this motor is wearing, this motor's TBN the oil being free of contamination, a longer run would have made sense. But if you want to know what you and your motor are capable of, you have to start with your own data and then build a trend and see what's applicable because some engines are out there living an easy life with lots of highway mileage and little in the way of short trips or stop and go driving. And that can end up producing vastly different results than engines that are tasked with a lot of stop and go, a lot of short trips, more heat cycles, the engine being started up far more often throughout the day, so on and so forth. So start with your motor, your oil, and then we'll tailor our recommendations to you. That brings episode 129 to a close. Thank you all for hanging with me. I'm glad you spent some time with us today. And if you have any topic suggestions for a Slick Talk episode, don't hesitate to reach out. You can email us, bstone at blackstone-labs.com. Just include Slick Talk in the subject line, and they'll forward it over to me. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. This is Blackstone Joe, signing off. The Slick Talk Podcast is powered by Blackstone Laboratories. If you're ready to start your oil analysis journey, visit blackstone-labs.com to order your free test kit.